Uh, good morning, everybody. Professor Richard Taylor, good morning. Good morning, Kalist. Uh, sorry for the delay to start. I, I, I think we are ready. I want to welcome everybody to the third webinar in a series of monthly webinars. And I want to take this opportunity once again to welcome Professor Richard Taylor, who will be taking us through our third seminar. Professor Richard Taylor has already taken us through the previous seminars. And for today, the topic we are having is hydrological consequences of climate change in the Ruenzori Mountains of Uganda. Professor Richard Itera, for those of you who probably have not read his introduction, has done a lot of work in Uganda, and he continues to share with us the interesting findings of his work. And we are happy once again to have him speak to us. So Professor Richard Itera, you can add on, but I want us to start. And then we shall have opportunities for questions, clarifications at the end of your talk. But I want to request people to also put their comments in the chat as we progress. Without wasting any more time, can I invite you, Professor Richard Taylor, to take us through the presentation? Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kalist. I will um, uh, I will now begin the process of sharing my screen. And um, are you able to see my screen now? Yes. Okay, very yes, good. Then. Yeah, yes, see. okay, then good morning, everyone. Uh, 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 thank you for having me again. And um, I'll now uh, uh, begin this presentation on the hydrological uh, consequences of climate change, in this case, with specifically deglaciation um, in the Renzori Mountains. Um, I would like to begin by saying that um, uh, the data and, and uh, analyses that will be presented in this uh, presentation um, involved quite a few people, um, in, including Dr. Kalis Tindumugaya, uh, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Bob Nakaliza from the Mountain Resource Center at Macquarie University, Abishin Majugu from the Meteorology Department, um, and a number of others. So I just wanted to make it quite clear this is not a singular effort that I'm reporting on here and uh, um, uh, very appreciative of those contributions people have made. Um, I like this photo that I begin with in, in the cover. It's um, um, what you are looking at is the Speak Glacier in the Renzori Mountains, is, which is obviously the white ice that you can see in the central part of this photo. Um, and in the foreground, uh, you can see the vegetation, which includes um, uh, tree senecio and helichrysum, um, which is in the bottom left corner, the helichrysum. And this is some of the distinctive Afro-Alpine uh, vegetation that one can see in the Renzori Mountains. And um, it, uh, obviously, it's a, a bit of a jewel, as they say, in Uganda, and an extremely beautiful place uh, to visit. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, of course, uh, with a warming world, one of the things we have been seeing um, is changes in the amount of ice that is here. And uh, what I'll be speaking about today is the consequences of this for uh, river flow. So I'll begin by talking about the Renzori Mountains themselves. We'll go a little bit of geology very briefly on formation and process of glaciation, and then we'll move on to the notion or the uh, observations of deglaciation that has taken place and its links to climate change. We'll then move to discuss the contribution of the meltwater flows uh, to river discharge, and then we'll look towards the future um, uh, in uh, of the ice fields themselves within the Renzori Mountains. So to begin, we go back some time, but recognizing that the Renzori Mountains themselves are part of the East African Rift System, and this includes the western arm of the East African Rift, 
which we know today includes Lake Edward, Lake George, and of course, the Rensselaer Mountains themselves. And so if we go back in time, say five to 10 million years ago, the drainage across Uganda of the Katonga, the Kagera, the Kafu, they all used to be part of the River Congo. And in, the, uh, in this period of the Miocene, the formation of a Paleo Lake Oberuka, in which it created a, a, a small trough into which those rivers drained, and then the drainage went further on uh, um, uh, to the west into the Congo Basin. Now, the beginnings of the Renzori uh, Mountains were that this uh, old Paleo Lake Elberuka um, was um, the beginnings of the rift, to the formation of the rift itself. And as the formation of the rift uh, began uh, um, uh, more pronounced in the late Pliocene uh, to Pleistocene, what we see is the, um, uh, the upthrusting. So what I, what I would say is if we look at the left side of this screen, what we know is classically the rift valley in which Lake George and Lake Edward reside. These um, uh, are what we would call form from a graben, which is where you have two parallel faults and the land surface falls. So that's when we uh, uh, drive to Kasese or something like that, we will see the sharp escarpment and that's where the land surface has fallen. The Renzoe Mountains are not volcanic as you may well know, unlike uh, the mountains further to the south on the uh, with bordering with um, uh, um, uh, Rwanda and uh, Dr. Kalisa's home area of Kabali, what we are seeing in the horse is you have a, the, the reverse of forming a rift valley is the upthrust, which is also part of the uh, rift system itself, and this is, can occur. And it's known as a Horst. The Germans had a big part of this sort of early geomorphology. And what you can see here, and I think there's two things I just wanted to, uh, to make uh, clear to you, is that um, the Ranzoris are a Horst. So that's the uplifting of the, um, of the land surface. But also notice, quite importantly, the angle of that tilting and upthrust. And what you can see is, if we go to something like the peaks of the Renzori Mountains, they primarily drain in an eastward direction towards Uganda into Lake George, and that the drainage to the DRC side of the Renzori um, Mountains is very steep and very small by comparison. So the catchments that um, are supplied, if you will, by glaciation in the Renzori Mountains are primarily in Uganda rather than in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And what happened is that upthrusting, if you will, of the horse to form the Renzori Mountains, it split the old lake in half. And actually you also had the, you had uplift and downlift and the lakes formed Lake George and Lake Edward. And you had Renzori Mountains, which separates of course, these two lakes. And further details, of course, is it forced rivers flow, formerly flowing westward to reverse on themselves. And that gave rise, of course, to Lakes Chioga and Lake Victoria. Right, so the key bit here is we have mountains that have been created from this, uh, within the rift system itself. And this uplift was very, very substantial. So, we're probably all familiar that the uh, lowland plains surrounding the Renzori Mountains have an elevation of somewhere around 1,000 or 1,100 meters above sea level. Well, the Renzori Mountain upthrust was in the order of over in the approximately four kilometers. And that's important because what we can now see is that the peak of the Renzori Mountains is at um, just over five kilometers above mean sea level. Uh, so 5,109 meters. Now, this elevation is quite important to note, okay? Um, because when we look at the, uh, 
as we all know, there is something in uh, that the uh, the air temperatures cool as you go higher in elevation. And this um, gradient of cooling, you might know, is sometimes referred to as the environmental lapse rate. And it roughly has a magnitude of about six and a half degrees per thousand meters or per kilometer. So if you start at an elevation of about a uh, thousand meters above mean sea level, and if we were to say that the mean air temperatures in Cassese each year are somewhere in the order of about 24 degrees Celsius, um, uh, what you can now see is how far do you have to go up before you reach freezing conditions in which snow and ice can form? And so four kilometers, that's four times 6.5, that's 26 degrees. Um, so essentially, when you move up, you get to the top of the Renzori Mountains, which should have a mean um, uh, 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 temperature of about minus two degrees. And so essentially, that is the explanation as to why we have glaciers um, in, on the Renzori Mountains. So a key point in the formation of glaciers themselves, you need to have air temperatures that are low enough to prevent snow falling as rain. And then secondly, it needs to persist long enough to be compacted into glacial ice. And that means as it snows, more snow occurs and more snow, and that overlying snow, the weight of it begins to compress that underlying snow. And so instead of having a very high density, which snow typically has, you it gets packed and packed and packed until eventually it uh, forms uh, glacial ice. Uh, and uh, so the ice fields, if you will, um, on the Renzori Mountains are uh, at an elevation in excess of about 4,600 meters. So that top, if you want to call it apex of the mountain, that very top bit, which exceeds elevations of about 4,600, 4,700 meters, these are where you find the ice fields and these are where glaciers um, uh, uh, can form. In the particular photo that you're looking at here, we're looking from the Stanley Plateau, which is the largest um, remaining uh, ice field in the Renzori Mountains. And you are looking west in this photograph, and you can now see the lowlands of the Democratic Republic of Congo to the west uh, in this uh, particular photo, which is that more green uh, landscape that you can see in the, back, uh, in the background. Now, a key thing to recognize, well, I guess we're all probably aware, is how um, fascinating and uh, distinct of the Renzori Mountains. You can think of them almost as an island of biodiversity. So Renzori Mountains, Elgon, Mount Kenya, and Kilimanjaro, these rather almost islands of biodiversity in, the, um, in, the East, Afri in East Africa are, um, uh, are distinctive in several aspects. They have this uh, fascinating Afro-Alpine vegetation, some of which you can see here, uh, the lobelias and helichrysum in the tree senecio in the background of this um, uh, photograph. And um, you're probably familiar with the term Nizuru, um, which is associated with the Renzoris. And um, Nizuru, of course, is a um, refers to the snow and ice. And this is also a central figure within the Bakonzo's traditional belief system. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, the um, um, and, uh, very important part of the, if you want to call it the cosmology um, uh, the, uh, of the Bukonzo in, uh, uh, in the surrounding areas. Um, and of course, many of these people also can assist you while you were in the Renzori Mountains and uh, 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 as indicated in the, uh, in the photo here. Um, in 2003, uh, so that's some t two decades ago, the glaciers uh, in uh, at the summit of the Renzori Mountains occupied an area of approximately one square kilometer. And this again is a Stanley Plateau that you're looking at here uh, with the Margarita Peak in the, uh, in the upper part of the backdrop uh, 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 in this uh, photo. And um, uh, so 
I, I think an important thing to recognize uh, is that the ice fields themselves do not occupy a very large area, a very large proportion of the upland environment. In fact, it's quite a small area that they occupy. Um, and a big question that has remained is what is actually the volume of ice, which is on the uh, on the Renzori uh, mountains themselves. And in some of this research, I again want to attribute uh, the excellent guide and supporting that came from Baluku Josephat here in the from the Renzori Mountaineering Service. Now, we look, if we put this measurement um, into a context um, and look at kind of observed de de uh, deglaciation in East Africa, and in here I've got data sets from um, Kilimanjaro and also from the, the Renzori Mountains, you can see that this pattern of um, uh, the reduction in the area occupied by glaciers has been occurring over much of the 20th century and into the 21st century. And so we saw largely linear trends, um, not only on Kilimanjaro, but also in on the Renzori Mountains. I think a couple of bits to uh, to indicate here. The um, there has been a recent slowing in the rate of deglaciation on Kilimanjaro, um, uh, as you can see here. And um, glaciers on Kilimanjaro aren't expected to um, disappear for. Uh, at least a few more decades. In fact, it may be quite a long time while that ice persists in Kilimanjaro. Just by comparison, I think it's important to note that the ice fields on Kilimanjaro are at elevations of between 5,300 and 5,700 meters above mean sea level. What this means is the ice fields on Kilimanjaro actually are well above the zero degree line uh, as we were trying to indicate um, earlier. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, they are not actually melting. And that's a kind of a curious um, uh, thing. I'm getting, getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but on Kilimanjaro, um, the glaciers themselves are not um, primarily melting. In fact, uh, they're being essentially starved of their moisture supply. And on Kilimanjaro, the reason why the glaciers are shrinking is primarily from the process of, um, if you would call it desiccation, they're drying up, they're sublimating, they're evaporating, they're going, and um, uh, that's the primary driver of deglaciation in the Kilim on Kilimanjaro, just because um, the glaciers themselves are well above the zero degree line. Um, in Uganda, if we were to look, and, and the Renzoris, if we were to look at the more recent measurements, um, uh, the intercept indicates uh, that the glaciers would disappear uh, by the end of this uh, current decade. I should say that predicting the disappearance of glaciers that are very small now <clears throat> becomes increasingly challenging just because there's many local factors that will if you want to call it, determine the final stages of the um, uh, of those glaciers, the degree to which they are in a shadow from the uh, peaks themselves uh, is one key local feature that will influence um, uh, their rate of disappearance. The main point, though, is they've been losing um, uh, quite considerably. Um, the area occupied by glaciers has been shrinking quite considerably. Uh, especially since the 60s, but also over much of the uh, the last century. What we noticed on uh, for some of the valley glaciers, so there is a Stanley Plateau, which is the largest remaining um, a patch of ice on the Renzori Mountains, but then the ice sort of, if you want to call it a bit like icing on a cake, the, the ice sort of also um, forms valley glaciers like the Elena Glacier here, the, the, the initial um, photograph from this presentation was for the Speak Glacier. And what you can see is uh, more recently, the rates of retreat of those valley glaciers have been very rapid in the order of tens of meters per year, even almost up to 100 meters per year. So the, the deglaciation has been accelerating uh, uh, more recently, particularly in the valley glaciers. Um, and this is just giving you some of the er earlier field uh, work that was uh, uh, done quite some time ago now. You can see the retreat 
So the, the spray painting here was indicating the terminus of a glacier in February 2005. And you can now see the terminus is well up here in April 2007. And so just visually, you can see that this deglaciation is occurring often quite uh, uh, rapidly. Now, maybe one final important uh, caveat if, in, in some of the uh, discussion here is that we have no continuous alpine meteorological observations in the Rensselaer Mountains. So quite a few of the inferences that we're making here between the climate glacier linkages are reliant on the um, uh, uh, meteorological stations, which you find in the lowlands, essentially in places like Kasese and Four Portal, uh, Kabali, Masindi, and places like that. So um, that's an important uh, bit to know. We are often assuming Therefore, that the changes in temperature we see in the lowlands uh, also apply to the uh, uh, to the uplands. Maybe a last point to, to note here is you can see, for instance, uh, the meltwater is running off the snout here of the Elena glass here. Um, and uh, obviously this photo was uh, uh, um, some time ago, but uh, you get the notion of how uh, the processes of deglaciation here uh, involves uh, melting in addition to the evaporation or sublimation, if you will, of the uh, of the glaciers themselves. If we look at some of this uh, lowland meteorological data, so data from Emberara, Fort Portal, Masindi, and Kabali, <coughs> excuse me, um, a, two key points to make is that we've been witnessing or observing uh, increases in temperatures uh, at those lowland stations um, uh, throughout the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st century. Um, but changes in precipitation, there are no statistically significant trends in precipitation. Of course, uh, well, not of course, uh, these data need to be revisited uh, uh, to, uh, to check again on, uh, but, um, you know, as of five to 10 years ago, there was no statistically significant change in precipitation observed but very clear rising trends in uh, or rising air temperatures are observed within the um, uh, uh, meteorological records. I guess the impl implications I'm, I'm making here is we're not seeing, it's not as if in the Renzori Mountains, the glaciers are being starved of snowfall or moisture. The um, meteorological data suggests that they are primarily um, uh, affected by warming temperatures, uh, and those rises are in excess of uh, the global mean temperature rises, and that these are driving uh, uh, deglaciation. So uh, we are looking here again at the snout of the um, uh, of the Elena Glacier, and you get a sense of the uh, meltwater uh, discharge coming off the uh, one part of that uh, snout of the Elena Glacier. And so a big question, and I guess the uh, uh, the heart of the, just, you know, following, I've given you that background, the heart of the presentation here is on what are the hydrological consequences of this recession in the um, uh, in the glass ice fields within the Renzori Mountains. Now, I'll just give you uh, some commentary uh, on Kilimanjaro just for uh, uh, a bit of context and comparison. And so, um, this is just some commentaries. Uh, uh, so several rivers on Kilimanjaro are drying out in the dry season due to the loss of the frozen reservoir. Now looking at a more recent photograph of Kilimanjaro. Uh, this was said by Lonnie Thompson, who is a kind of uh, globally famous uh, uh, climate scientist. The loss of Kilimanjaro's permanent ice fields will have hydrological implications for local populations who depend upon the water generated from the ice fields during the dry seasons and monsoon failures. Uh, another uh, kind of famous uh, quaternary science on climate and climate change, Francois Gass said, global warming may have serious implications for local populations that depend upon glacial meltwaters for farming, irrigation, and hydrologic, uh, hydroelectric power generation. And I guess what I wanted to interrogate a little bit here and what some of the commentary we'll have here is, are these assertions correct? And do they apply to the Renzori Mountains? Uh, 
We'll revisit that at the end of the presentation. So let's look more specifically at the glaciated head, uh, uh, headwaters um, in the Rensselaer Mountains. You may require, uh, recall from the earlier slide that the ice fields um, occupy and are pretty much on the boundary uh, with the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the, um, by the way, the white shading in this uh, 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 diagram here does not represent ice cover. Um, what it does represent is areas in theory that could support uh, ice fields um, based on an elevation estimate. And, uh, but it gives you an indication of where the ice fields uh, uh, and remaining ice fields on the Rensselaer Mountains exist. Um, and the drainage here indicated in the black lines is of the River Mabuku, which has a very substantial tributary in it called the River Bajuku. And uh, these, this is an area, we're going to look at this in, in, in more detail uh, in, the, in the subsequent slide. But this area, um, and if you remember, the tilt is primarily draining into Uganda from the ice fields. Um, uh, and uh, river discharge is being monitored um, at in the lowland environments with ga standard gauging stations that are along the Fort Portal Kasese Road. Um, in addition to the river Mabuku, ice fields also drain to a lesser extent and it's very steep and, and short, um, to the west and the rivers uh, Butahu and uh, Lusulube in the Democratic Republic of, uh, uh, of Congo. If we now look regionally, what does this look like? So you have the Renzori Mountains here with the drainage primarily coming down to the east into Uganda. It then often pulls and collects essentially for around Lake George, um, which along the Kazinga Channel then drains to Lake Edward. And then Edward, as you probably all know very well, drains northward along the River Samliki. And so curiously, um, the eastern eastward drainage from the Renzori Mountains um, essentially ends up doing uh, a, a very circular route to drain northwards from the river Samliki and then of course providing um, uh, drainage for that's uh, or contributions to the flow of the uh, Victoria Nile and the River Nile as it enters um, uh, the, the Sudan. Um, and for if for any of the historians out there are interested, um, this is something actually uh, the the Renzori Mountains are sometimes refer, referred to the Mountains of the Moon, Luna Montes, and uh, this was a, a a Roman geographer named Ptolemy who who lived in Alexandria in Egypt in the first and second century A.D., who was making the claim that the Mountains of the Moon are the source of the Nile, and in fact that original assertion. Um, uh, is indeed correct. So they, uh, the meltwaters from the river, from the, sorry, meltwaters from the Renzori Mountains do supply waters to the river Nile. And part of what we'll discuss in this presentation is how much. So uh, if we now look at, at the ice fields themselves, where the melting glaciers contribute flow into the um, uh, glaciated headwaters, um, you can see that we have this tributary um, uh, here in the center, and there is a lake in which a lot of this drainage pools, Lake Bajuku, and this flows uh, uh, downstream through some bogs, including the Bigo bogs here, upper and lower. Uh, or, uh, and then you can also see that some drainage does also occur um, westward into the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo. But the overwhelming majority of meltwater discharges are draining into the headwaters of the river Bajuku, which is a tributary of the river Mabuku. All right, important to understand the drainage here, because if you're going to assess the impact of melting uh, glaciers, you need to know where those contributions are going. So how did we do this analysis? Well, uh, this looked at um, an analysis of historical uh, trends um, in 
uh, in river discharge from those uh, 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 from uh, records, for instance, um, uh, for the river uh, uh, Mabuku, also Niamagasani, which is a adjacent uh, catchment uh, and other locations. And we tried to look at what are the what is the available um, hydrological data in the, at the in the lowlands tell us. In addition, some of this research also did spot measurements of stream discharge as you move from the top of the mountains downstream to try to understand where is the flow being generated from. And um, this, in this included uh, the spot measurements with some dilution gauging, which was done um, here. And this is actually very close to um, uh, Lake Bajuku. Uh, and this is actually the out essentially just downstream of the outlet of Lake Bajuku up in the Alfaro Alpine zone. Uh, of the Renzore Mountains. And I think let's begin actually with these data from uh, spot sampling at di different elevations as you move down the Renzore Mountains. And I think uh, if we look at the discharge now um, at the base of the um, Alfro Alpine uh, zone, including the Heath um, Moss Forest Zone and Montane Forest, um, we can look at some uh, um, discharge measurements here taken during the dry season and the wet season. And we have values of a cubic meters per second up to uh, six cubic meters per second. Um, and if we now convert this into a specific discharge, that's where you take the um, um, discharge and you divide it by the catchment area under which it is being generated. We get numbers, as you see here, around 990 and even up to 5,000 millimeters uh, per annum. And again, this is a, based on these uh, wet season discharges. If we now look at the um, contribution or the amount of the river discharge leaving the um, uh, areas like uh, Lake uh, Bajuku and the areas uh, for, uh, in uh, proximate to the glaciers themselves, you can see that there is a very, very, um, uh, that the amount of that river discharge is very, very small. That's a really important thing to recognize. So down slope of the, gla of the ice fields themselves, the river discharge and the stream discharge within the river Mabuku is very low. Now, what you can see, I think, is when you move from, and particularly in this case, Lake Bajuku, down to areas um, just below, I'm not talking the lowlands, but just below the very wet areas of the montane forest and the um, uh, what we call the Heath Moth Forest Zone, you have a tenfold increase in river discharge. Okay. And that's a, 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 an important thing to recognize. So where is the water coming from? Well, the majority of the water does not appear to be coming from the ice fields, but in that zone of very high uh, precipitation below it. This is the discharge from Lake Bajuku. And this is less, that discharge that you're seeing there is less than 2% of the river discharge um, that is observed uh, along the Fort Portal Cassisi Road at the base of the Renzori Mountains. Now, if we uh, think about this, much of the water that is in Lake Bajuku would have also come from uh, rainfall directly, rainfall running off the, the slopes of the peaks themselves, snow melt that has come from the peaks themselves. And so when we look at the discharge that is coming out of Lake Bajuku, which is about nearly a kilometer below the ice fields, when we look at that amount, much of that water in that lake will have come, as I said, from contributions other than meltwater flows from glaciers. So if that discharge is less than 2% of the river flow at the base of the mountains, you can imagine that the direct contribution of uh, meltwaters from the glaciers is much, much less than 2% of the flow observed at the base of the Renzori Mountains. If we now look at uh, some of the data sets, and again, this does not include 
data sets that have been uh, generated over the last decade. So I'm a little bit talking a bit about history here, but if we look at some of the earlier data, it was very, the uh, there are significant gaps in some of the time series uh, records. And if we look, for instance, at the River Niamagasani and River Mabuku, for instance, it's really inadequate to assess trends, whether river discharge is going up or down. What we can see is during the early 1960s from available data from, for instance, Semliki River and also for River Mabuku, is that the rivers did respond uh, to the very high precipitation that occurred during the early 1960s. And you may know that Lake Victoria rose quite considerably in the early 1960s, um, and this was a function of uh, enhanced uh, rainfall that occurred over that period. So you can imagine enhanced snowfall and rainfall in the Renzori Mountains helped uh, lead to these anomalously high uh, river discharges during the early 1960s. Um, I want to focus now for a moment. There's a very interesting um, statistic to look here. The river Nyamagasani and river Mabuku are adjacent to each other in the Renzori Mountains. And um, what you can see um, is the specific discharge. So that's the river discharge divided by the catchment area, okay? B basically, the capacity of that catchment to generate uh, 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 river discharge. You can see that the value for the river Mabuku is much, much greater than the river Niamagasani, more than three times. There's a second property which I haven't presented here, but which is well known to many hydrologists, which is that the river Mabuku's flow is actually several degrees cooler than the river Niamagasani. And so when I've been speaking with uh, 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 hydrologists locally and, uh, and, and, and back in Entebbe in, uh, in Uganda on, um, uh, on the river discharge, the cooler temperature and the much higher specific discharge was, if you want to call it, enough evidence for them that the glaciers are contributing substantially to the river flow. That water is cooler and there's just so much more of it. The glaciers must be uh, making a major contribution to that river flow. And I have another explanation, okay, uh, to that, uh, uh, for those causes, and it's here. If we now look, for instance, this is looking at the different ecotones, if you will, within the Renzori environment. You have grasslands in the lowlands, and they extend up to just about 2,000 meters above uh, mean sea level. Then you have the montane forest, the heath moss forest zone, and the alp alpine system. If we now look at some of the data here, the uh, rainfall in uh, um, uh, at the in Kasese and at the base of the mountains, um, this is marginally over a thousand millimeters per year, maybe eleven hundred millimeters per year. When you move into the montane forest, heath moss forest zone, and Afro alpine system, um, uh, the uh, rainfall doubles and and more, and so you have much greater rainfall in the uplands. Okay, in these, which is not surprising, it's reflected in the vegetation as well. You have much greater rainfall. And if we now look up, um, this is on a hypsometric map. So this is where you look at the area of a catchment that lies within a particular elevation. If we look, you can see that in black, 70% of the river Mabuku's catchment lies within this very wet zone and cool zone uh, at elevations between two and in excess of four kilometers in area, 70% of its catchment area. If you look at the adjacent river Niamagasani, 25% of its upper catchment, if you will, resides in these areas. Okay, so the, um, uh, that has some important implications. In these upper zones, rainfall is higher, evapotranspiration is less. And that means that effective precipitation, you might say, P minus ET, or the surplus, the water surplus of precipitation over evaporation, is much greater in the, uh, in the uplands uh, than it is uh, in the lowlands. And this 
um, in part uh, means those re that re those reduced evaporative losses. Um, it's able to generate a, just a much greater amount of water. It's also cooler, uh, naturally, because of that cooler environment. So the high specific discharge and low temperature of the river Mabuku derive from high rainfall and cooler temperatures of its catchment, which is uh, uh, that exists mostly within the heath moss forest and montane forest ecotones. And the argument being made here is contributions uh, from melting ice fields that are less, much less now than a square kilometer in area are minuscule. The gauged area of the river uh, Mabuku in Kisese is 256 square kilometers. I think you can now see that it would be odd for a patch of ice of perhaps half a square kilometer or less now would be able to generate somehow a huge amount or a considerable portion of the flow of the river of uh, the river Mabu Mabuku. If we now think about the future, what's going? What what is the reality of people um, uh, now and and in the near future um, uh, in the Renzori Mountains? I'd like to revisit again something that I've mentioned now in the previous two seminars, is that in a warming world. We're in a transition to fewer but heavier rainfalls, and that this transition is most pronounced or greatest in the tropics. So what we can imagine and now predict quite logically is that if the river Mabuku's uh, discharge is overwhelmingly, almost entirely derived from upland rainfall, and that rainfall is intensifying you can imagine that the amplification of extreme rainfall worsens or will worsen into the future, the flood risk, especially from the uh, river Mabuku, which is where dominantly the rain falls in its catchment, where dominantly the rainfall is falling. It not only affects uh, extreme heavy rainfall, also uh, with fewer but heavier rainfalls, it means the low flows will also be lower. We have to think, not only what are the consequences are for the hydrology, but also recognize what are the ecological impacts of these changes as well. Certainly there'll be vegetation that depends upon some threshold amount of humidity and water, and maybe those are threatened by the low flows. But clearly, as we know very well, the floods can be quite devastating. Another question really to ask ourselves is what role might the bogs play in regulating river discharge by reducing the flood discharges by say absorbing some of those uh, peak flows and that heavy rainfall and the degree to which what might they sustain low flows by releasing water um, uh, during those uh, low flows themselves. The photo behind you is of the um, uh, lower uh, and larger uh, Beagle bog in the Renzori Mountains itself. So you can see that kind of lowland environment, very flat, is a great, if you want to call it, trap for the floodwater uh, discharges. So if we think about uh, uh, future analysis, by the way, the photo in front of you is the confluence of the Bajuku tributary coming from the right and the Mabuku coming from the left. And this is where the, the flow really picks up in the Renzori Mountains. So future analysis might interrogate the available data of river discharge and rainfall to assess these trends and hydrological extremes and to explore the role of groundwater storage in the upland um, uh, bogs. So to wrap up now, deglaciation in the Renzori Mountains is driven primarily by global warming. I should say that the transition to fewer but heavier precipitation events means that the glaciers are also less protected by cloud cover so they have greater periods where they're exposed to insulation, solar radiation. And this in, in as well um, is uh, driving deglaciation because they're, if you want to call it more exposed. And if you have fewer but heavier rainfalls, it means that the accumulation of dust on top of the white, the, the white snow here 
reduces the albedo. And again, those glaciers, again, will absorb more solar radiation if they are, um, uh, uh, in the, as the dust darkens the surface. So temperature is a major, temperature rise is a major driver, but so are, is the um, uh, greater exposure uh, and um, uh, lower albedo uh, driving that deglaciation. The argument being, being made here is that, that the contribution of glacial meltwaters to river discharge is very small, even during low flow periods. The intensification of precipitation due to global warming, which is most pronounced in the tropics, is projected to amplify hydrological uh, extremes, so floods and low flow events. So when we look to, of course, there was the tragic uh, uh, flood discharges of May uh, 2020. Um, I guess the, the stark warning I'm trying to give here is that um, uh, these are part of the future of the Renzori Mountains. Um, uh, and uh, we should be recognizing that uh, in this, uh, 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 in a warming world with amplified pre precipitation, the flood risk uh, is going to increase. Clearly, it would be great for us to develop a better understanding of not only how this intensification of rainfall is impacting river discharge, but also the potential role of bogs in mitigating uh, these events. Maybe just to uh, to wrap up slightly, um, uh, I just um, note uh, colleagues who've been involved in this work, and for, including um, uh, uh, our chair, uh, Dr. Kalista Numugaya. Uh, this is also Andrew Mwanga from the Department of Geology at Macquarie University, and we are uh, moving in well into the Afro Alpine zone here. And also some colleagues, Baluku Jasafat and Nelson Job Kisaka, who was formerly at uh, uh, Macquarie University. In terms of uh, some of the impacts, well, this is a picture through the very wet um, uh, Heath Moth Forest Zone. And here you can see uh, consequences of, uh, uh, of boulders coming down the Renzori Mountains and destroying footbridges, which is up in, making obviously uh, movement within the Renzori Mountains uh, uh, more problematic. On that note, Chair, I will hand it back over to you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Richard Taylor, for the very, very interesting presentation. You did highlight a number of issues which really are uh, very, very interesting. You talked about the glaciation and the causes of the glaciation. You also talked about the impact of the glaciation on river flows. And of course, also indicating that the glaciers are shrinking because of, the, of drying up. And of course, because the glaciers are above the zero zone. And of course, you also indicated the, uh, clearly that global warming is driving glaciation in the Renzori mountain. You also indicated, the, uh, talked about the contribution of glacial merit on river discharge. You also indicated that uh, Due to global warming, of course, we are going to have intensification of uh, hydrological extremes and also highlighted what we really need to look at moving forward. I want to open the floor for comments, colleagues. So we are going to take a number of comments, questions for Professor Richard Taylor. We'll take about five at a go, then he'll respond. Some of the comments will be in the chat, we shall pick them up, uh, and then we see how we progress. So let me invite questions, comments from the floor. You can put up your hands or you can speak out. I'm trying to make sure that I see the hands which are up. But also, Professor Richard Taylor, you can also look in the chat and see what could be coming through there as we wait for the hands to come up. Yes, I see some hand up, Michael. Or you, or, or, or you are prouding the the presentation. I have a quick response to Jesse at thirty. Uh, um, yes, I will uh, be happy to to uh, to participate in any way you would like in the conference on the eighteenth and nineteenth of May. Uh, I would imagine it would be online if that's possible, but let me know. 
Okay, that's the, uh, thank you very much. For the presentation, we'll be sharing the presentation colleagues after this uh, uh, talk. Uh, we'll share with, with everybody. So Christopher, your hand is up. Yes, uh, I think I can go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, Professor Taylor, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Christopher Benana. I'm a, I'm a science journalist based in Kampala. I'm wondering which year is your latest database on? And if I'm interested in doing up a follow-up story, uh, like uh, on the likelihood that uh, uh, River Nyamwamba or Pippin Kasese will have more floods, I would like to do a follow-up with an interview with you. Is it possible? Uh, the, the answer is yes, but I, I want to um, emphasize one thing. Uh, uh, the analysis that have been presented here, um, in part, some of, some of that uh, uh, are uh, um, dated. It doesn't mean they're wrong. It, what I would say in terms of the analysis of deglaciation, there has not been a published study um, uh, since this work has been uh, pr uh, presented. So it's the latest, if you want to call it, published study on the deglaciation in the Renzori Mountains. On the subject of the increased frequency of floods, this is derived from the logic. I would now say to you, Christopher, it is a very reasonable hypothesis, um, but it would it requires further work to interrogate the existing um, uh, observational records collected by the um, uh, uh, well by the uh, um, uh, water resources uh, uh, regulation and the and the directorate itself. So we would um, uh, uh, so I, I would. Uh, so Christopher, the answer is yes. Um, uh, and what I would be doing is arguing it's a logical hypothesis following from the research that's being done, but it requires uh, uh, further analysis to verify, okay? Oh, okay, thank you. So colleagues, any other comment? Any other question, comment on what has been presented? I hope it has been well understood. So uh, Richard in the chat, there is a comment by Pamela Musimenta. Oh, sorry. You can look at that and respond as we wait here from the others. Sorry, let me just... Okay, just... Okay, sorry, there we go. Uh, okay, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, so uh, Pamela Mosamenta, um, on this, uh, uh, but, uh, it's an important, it, I'm glad you asked this uh, uh, question because um, the analysis that's presented here and if you want to call it the judgment of insufficient uh, historical data, this is based on records that were available uh, up to about 10 years ago. So in the, in the last decade, of course, there's been um, monitoring that has taken place. By the way, monitoring is um, challenged in part by the, um, the nature of the river flow here. You can see even in the, I think you can still see the, uh, the photo in front of you, um, measuring river flow within such environments uh, uh, where you have boulders of greater than a meter in, in diameter is a, is a challenge. But I, the point being, there has been um, considerable efforts to monitor the river discharge in the last decade, and it's time to uh, revisit those records and um, assess the uh, uh, what, what we can from those in terms of the amplification of extremes and perhaps the trends overall in river discharge. Um, uh, but yes, we can maybe, 
um, uh, you ask another question about um, uh, issues of data and, and data gaps. It does take uh, um, uh, very careful uh, work to, to tease out some of those, um, uh, what can be done uh, with records that have considerable amounts of, uh, of gaps. And I'm, um, I'm happy perhaps to carry on a conversation uh, around such an analysis. And clearly, um, you, you mentioned lastly, there isn't global data available. Yes, well, the, um, uh, there are no uh, uh, gl uh, global data, uh, data sets that would have data because the only data for the river, say, Niamagasani and Bujuku, and sorry, Mabuku, um, uh, would be those that have been collected by the ministry. Uh, so uh, that's really the, the, the data set to focus on. Uh, I can see that there's another question from Julius Bazabu. Uh, what are the most likely impact of glaciation uh, on the neighboring areas? When you say neighboring areas, um, I would, uh, Julius, um, uh, yeah, what, okay, the, um, uh, I, I presume, do you mean bordering catchments or do you mean neighboring areas? Uh, you, uh, uh, I presume you're not thinking Mount Elgon or uh, Mount Kenya. If I, if I make an assumption, you mean neighboring areas, um, uh, 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 in other areas within the Renzori Mountains. Um, I guess what I would argue is that the glaciers are telling you and giving you a climate signal. They're telling you that the climate is changing and has changed because they are destabilized and that's why they are receding in their area and the terminal positions are retreating. So they reflect a change in, if you want to call it the mean climate. The argument I'm making here is that the uh, what a robust impact of warming, which is what we're, which is re reflected in deglaciation, a robust impact of warming is this intensification of rainfall, which we do see in observed meteorological uh, records across the tropics. And so I said the most. So therefore, I'm extending really your question. The most likely impact um, is the. Um, intensification of rainfall, which includes uh, greater or higher extreme rainfalls and also lower, if you want to call it, extreme rainfalls. And um, uh, those are the uh, consequences. So more variable river discharge, low flows are lower, peak flows are higher. Now you ask what can be done to reduce the impacts of uh, uh, glaciation. Um, in part, um, Land cover change is also has a big impact on terrestrial water balances. And so um, avoiding um, uh, what we would call the clearing of forest cover. So maintaining and even engaging in afforestation programs uh, to retain um, and expand if possible, can, it, depending on whether deforestation has been a problem. But um, afforestation would be one way of trying to off offset this because you would have uh, um, it would it would serve to um, uh, um, both the interception within the canopy and also the um, uh, the magnitude of runoff would be li more limited in a well treed environment compared to one where the uh, the trees have been removed. Um, you and Moses Lubanga, you ask a very good question. What is the impact on our biodiversity as a country? And um, uh, so one of the big concerns is when you have uh, the retreat and possibly ultimate disappearance of glaciers at the, at the summit of Renzori Mountain, uh, Mountains, what key, uh, uh, what's the key impact on some of the biodiversity there, whether we are talking primarily plant or even the, not only the flora, but also the fauna in that, uh, in that area? Um, uh, my, uh, my guess is that uh, the responses, that if you want to call it, the responses in the biodiversity will be uh, have a longer lag time. Uh, so the glaciers are a great, if you want to call it, symbol of change. Um, um, but we may eventually see changes in the biodiversity um, uh, that we uh, uh, could be losing in the Renzori uh, Mountains as a consequence of warming. Um, I, I understand that Brian 
Uh, Guma has a question. Perhaps we can take a question before I go into more of the uh, comments. Uh, I don't know, yes. Chair. I'll Let, leave let's that take to a you. question. Let's take a question from Dr. Brian Guma, and then we come back to the comments. Okay. So over to you, Dr. Guma. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kalist. Thank you, uh, Professor Richard. Uh, this comes at a time, of course, when we are looking for more answers on the flooding within the rain stories. Uh, we, have, we have been having a couple of floods in the, for the past 10 years. They have been occurring after, after every two years. And, uh, and uh, some hydrologists actually have placed these floods as not normal. They are, they are not associated to meteorological flooding. Uh, this comes at a time when uh, notice uh, volumes up to about 1,000 cubic uh, coming in from uh, the Renzori Mountains for most of the rivers of uh, getting waters from the Renzoris have very high, high volumes. So uh, I just wanted, of course, uh, for purpose of uh, everyone, at least to uh, maybe throw in more light, especially on uh, these very high intense uh, rains of flooding events that are not associated to uh, the meteorologic flooding. And then maybe uh, the other issue that maybe I would want you to throw more light on is on uh, the sediment, the boulders. During these flooding events, we usually have a uh, high uh, uh, debris flow or boulder flow from the Renzori Mountains. Uh, maybe from your perspective, is this an indication of, of course, uh, uh, the continuous stripping of the land surface uh, within the Renzoris uh, that uh, we should expect over and over again during these major flooding events? So I just wanted maybe for you to throw in more light on this so that uh, everyone can appreciate. Thank you, Professor. Uh uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Brian Guma, for your question. Um, I, um, my understanding uh, is that uh, in the Renzori Mountains National Park, that uh, there is no, that there are, it's as a protected environment, uh, that the um, that substantial changes in land cover would not occur through um, human deforestation, as an example, or clearing the vegetation, but they may very well have occurred as a consequence, for instance, of fire, where large fires, and, and large fires, by the way, would be promoted in effect by reduced uh, by a shift to extreme. So if you have lower amounts of, of rain falling during the dry season, there, uh, the, the, there, the, the risk of fire um, uh, presumably uh, increases. Now, it could be that fire um, has been a major consequence of land cover or a major factor of land cover change, say above elevations of uh, 2,700 meters, for instance, um, uh, which I believe is uh, essentially roughly the elevation around which the Renzori Mountains National Park um, is, uh, uh, maybe may actually be a bit lower than that, but roughly speaking, it, in, in elevations above, say, two or two and a half thousand meters, we, the, these areas, as I understand it, I could be wrong, are protected as being in the Renzori National Park. So land cover change there may be driven by fire. At elevations, say, below 2,000 meters uh, that are not protected by their, uh, by their um, uh, location within uh, Renzori Mountains uh, National Park, it could be that uh, land cover change, uh, whether it's involving the removal of tree cover or replacement of tree cover for crops or other um, uh, or coffee or other things, there, the other um, uh, uh, consequences is that these could themselves um, ha have led to um, uh, greater erosion. Um, and But one of the things is with those very high flows, of course, the higher flows have a higher energy able to move larger boulders downstream. And uh, so the movement of these boulders is a natural, if you want to call it, uh, consequence. This is just, this is the way that these rivers operate. They They deliver very large boulders downstream um, and with higher energies uh, occurring, um, uh, 
uh, we should expect to see uh, uh, even bigger boulders or bo large boulder or increased frequency of these boulders coming downstream. I would say in terms of the sediment supply, um, it could be that the changes in land cover and the catchments draining to the rivers um, uh, uh, below that may, be, uh, may also be uh, a driver uh, of this change. Of course, we can speculate as I am right now. It, it does require, uh, of course, um, uh, uh, detailed assessments to, uh, to better understand uh, uh, what in, in truth are the, uh, the factors driving this. I don't know if I've answered the question uh, fully, uh, uh, Brian, but you can you can let me know if you have any follow up. You can maybe go to the other comments, Richard, in the chat. Okay. Yes, I can see one about mitigating hydrological extremes, and I think um, so. I guess getting following on the answers I've just given um, in areas that have been affected by fire, it's promoting afforestation programs clearly with. Uh, trying to uh, uh, promote programs that are that are not introducing any new species, but um, are afforestation programs that are, um, uh, uh, if you want to call it, um, uh, uh, promoting the recovery of the uh, natural vegetative cover um, in the Renzori Mountains, and also in, in areas uh, uh, within the uh, active human environment below the the park boundaries. Um, it would be uh, promoting afforestation programs to try to um, uh, reduce the um, uh, runoff draining towards the river channels themselves and, uh, and, and seeking to utilize and intercept more of those uh, um, uh, precipitation extremes. Um, I'm now just... Uh, you've meant. I can see Julius. You have a, a comment on on uh, impacts of glaciation or deglaciation on wetland ecosystems. Um, uh, I wonder whether you're referring to the bogs themselves. Um, one of the uh, 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 the factors again when we talk about deglaciation here, um, um, it's it's what does the what do the changes represent? And if we think of that more broadly, is the changes in climate. Uh, that are occurring that can affect wetland uh, ecosystems. Um, it would be the um, the amplification of extremes where you have um, uh, uh, fewer um, uh, rainfall events during the dry season, and this could lead to a greater desiccation of the bogs, which depend on a on uh, on a, uh, a if you want to call it wet con wet humid conditions throughout the year. Um, so you could see uh, um, uh, some drying out of the uh, uh, of the bog ecosystems a little bit, and of course the greater um, flow energies during the peak floods may even lead to a erosion of those uh, bog systems. So I guess the bogs are affected. The wetland ecosystems, the bogs and the uplands, are um, uh, are impacted by that uh, shift. Um, uh, uh, that we are uh, uh, expecting to be occurring in the uh, um, in, in the river discharge. Richard, do you see anything else that you haven't responded to? I can see one that says here: Would the sign uh, would that's uh, myself, I presume, uh, give data on how close the next forceful impact might occur in the Renzori region? Now, so um, one of the things uh, to recognize is, first of all, we've heard from Brian Guma about the nature of the flood discharges that have occurred um, uh, in the uh, 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 in the Renzori region. And so it's better understanding what is uh, what is causing these peak uh, 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 floods. But as I said in my earlier response, to try to reduce the impact of this is um, trying to um, <clears throat> uh, maintain and, and and expand where where necessary uh, the um, uh, the um, uh, the natural vegetative cover and particularly in the in, uh, in the base of the montane forest and in the lowlands trying uh, to ensure um, that land clearing is restricted so that you are maintaining the uh, uh, a vegetative cover um I uh yes I think that's probably um um uh, that for that and uh, oh you mentioned I didn't refer to Niamwamba in my discussion 
Um, yeah, so Nyem Wamba um, it has a catchment that's um, similar in, uh, uh, obviously it drains, instead of draining um, uh, uh, eastward into Uganda, it sort of drains more southward. And uh, that um, is got a similar catchment, if you want to call it demographics, to Nyamagasani. Um, one of the reasons it was not mentioned, well, there wasn't only so much that could be presented, it wasn't mentioned in the discussion is uh, mainly because the, uh, the historical river discharge data, uh, again, is more limited um, uh, there. Um, but again, there's records over the last decade or, uh, or so, um, and it would be really interesting and worthwhile to be uh, interrogating those uh, to better understand uh, the nature of uh, the flood risk that is occurring there. These, by the way, the Ni River Niamba does not receive meltwater contributions. So just to be clear about that, neither does Niam Gasani. So neither of those rivers are receiving meltwaters from glaciers. The only river uh, in uh, of drainage, just to, to make that clear, that's receiving meltwater contributions is the River Mabuku. I don't know if there are any other questions. Okay. Colleagues, any other comment? Before I bring this uh, discussion to an end. Okay. So we seem to have uh, had uh, uh, enough of uh, the discussions. So uh, maybe Professor Richard Taylor, any final Comments, any final remarks? Again, wrapping it up before we bring this to an end. Yes, I, I thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Kaliste. Um, I, uh, what I'd, I'd like to kind of pr provide some perspective. The hydrological consequences that I've discussed here in this, in this session um, are based on analyses that have been uh, con uh, uh, conducted, mu uh, many of them, uh, uh, up to about a decade ago. I'm uh, presenting them to you uh, today because the, it, it, as you probably know, sometimes getting some of these messages out is, is challenging. And then the opportunity to get these important messages out, I think is, um, is important, particularly considering uh, the nature of uh, the recent flood risks that have been affecting people quite seriously. Uh, and of course, our, the May 2020 event in particular, um, uh, how it's affecting people. And we need to be thinking uh, quite clearly about how we can reduce um, the impacts on the communities uh, in these environments. And I think the efforts that have been made uh, by the ministry um, uh, to collate and uh, maintain the monitoring infrastructure uh, uh, in this region is fantastic. And I think it's, uh, it's a great opportunity now to, um, to interrogate some of those records and best understand um, as best as possible, the uh, uh, the nature uh, uh, of how climate change is impacting the river discharge in the Renzori Mountains. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Richard Teira, really for this very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, of course, there have been a lot of discussions about the Renzori and the weather flooding is being caused by the melting of the glaciers and all of that, but I think your presentation has put the messages right. Even if some of the data is odd, it, it, it portrays what is happening, and I think it calls upon all of us to do a bit more to update what has been done. I know there are a number of organizations that are also doing some work in that area, and I'm sure that when information from them comes up, we'll be able to get uh, the situation as it is. We are doing also a lot of work in the Renzori region. Right now, we are developing an integrated water resources development and management strategy for the Renzori region. And certainly this work which are presented will inform that study. We are doing also a lot of work in the Nyamwamba area, trying to protect the catchment, but also try to deceal it and clean up the river so that the water can flow. So again, it's work that continues, the challenges are still there, 
but the sharing and giving that broad perspective on the, the geomorphology of Uganda and how the drainage was created and why what we are seeing is an influence of tectonic activity, very, very much appreciated. On behalf of the team at the Water Resources Institute and the Ministry in general, I want to thank you for the three webinars you kicked us off in December. In January, we're together. We are together today. We are happy that you have spared time to be with us. We shall certainly continue calling upon you because there is a lot that you can share with us and we continue engaging you. And of course, we hope to see you soon in Uganda physically so that you can interact with the people. I know Uganda is at your heart. We hope to see you soon in Uganda. Yes. And colleagues, colleagues, uh, we'll continue with our monthly webinars. As I've said previously, we want to, read to use this opportunity to share. So any of you would be having some information, some work you have done, practical work, research work, academic work, let us know, contact the Water Resources Institute through the email of the Institute, which always communicates to you so that we can share with you. And the next webinar is going to be the last Friday of, of March. Uh, maybe let me check my... My, my, my calendar, the last Friday of March will be 31st March. So take note, colleagues, 31st March, and Professor Richard Taylor, we invite you, if you have some time, come in and listen in, but also we shall be calling upon you and also maybe asking you to look at some of the other colleagues you are working with who can also be invited to share so that we can continue the running. With those, I thank everybody for sparing the time. I thank the team at the Water Resources Institute for organizing this. And of course, final again, let's big, give a very big applause, Professor Richard Taylor. He's online, but I'm sure you will hear the applause. Thank you very much, Richard, <laughs> and wish you a nice day. Yeah, thank you. Thank it's you. Yeah. Gwendolyn, you have something to say? Okay. Give it a, a clap. Oh, when was, was clapping and the other colleagues yeah. were clapping. So thank yeah. you very much. And we end our webinar today. We'll see you next month. Thank you very much. A nice weekend to all of you. Okay, bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Nice to see you Brian. Nice to see you Richard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, hey, Matt, I will follow up with you by email. Okay. Okay. Okay, Prof. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, great. Yeah.